in recent years, controversy surrounding rap music has been in the forefront of the American media. From the hype of the East Coast, West Coast rivalry, to the demonization of modern music in the wake of school shootings in Littleton, Colorado. It seems, however, critics are quick to point out the violent lyrics of some rappers. They are missing the point of the messenger. Rap, like other forms of music, cannot be understood unless it's studied without a frame of its historical and social context. Today, rap music reflects its origin in the hip hop culture of young, urban, working class African Americans. Its roots in the African oral tradition, its function as a voice of an otherwise underrepresented group. And as its popularity has grown, its commercialization and appropriation by the music industry. Hip hop music is generally considered to have been pioneered in New York's South Bronx in 1973 by Jamaican born Cool DJ Herc at a Halloween dance party thrown by his younger sister. Herc used an innovative turntable technique to stretch a song's drum break by playing the break portion of two identical records consecutively. The popularity of the extended break lent its name to breakdancing, a style specific to hip hop culture, which was facilitated by extended drum breaks played by DJs at New York dance parties. By the mid 1970s, New York hip hop scene was dominated by the seminal turntablist DJ Grandmaster Flash, African Bambata, and Herc. The rappers of Sugar Hill Gang produced hip hop's first commercially successful hit, Rapper's Delight, in 1979. Rap itself, the rhymes spoken over hip hop music, began as a commentary on the ability or skills of a particular DJ while that DJ was playing records at a hip hop event. MCs, the forerunners of today's rap artists, introduced DJs and their songs and often recognized the presence of friends in the audience at hip hop performances. Their role was carved out by popular African American radio disc jockeys in New York during the late 1960s who introduced songs and artists with spontaneous rhymes. The innovation of MCs caught the attention of hip hop fans. Their rhymes lapped over from the transition period between the end of one song and the introduction of the next to the songs themselves. Their commentaries moved solely from a DJ's skills to their own personal experiences and stories. The role of an MC in performances rose steadily and they began to be recognized as artists in their own right too. The local popularity of the rhythmic music served by DJs at dance parties and clubs combined with an increase in b-boys, break dancers, and graffiti artists and the growing importance of MCs created a distinctive culture known as hip hop. For the most part, hip hop culture was defined and embraced by young urban working class African Americans. Hip hop music originated from a combination of traditionally African American forms of music, including jazz, soul, gospel, and reggae. It was created by working class African Americans who, like Herc, took advantage of available tools like vinyl records, turntables, to invent a new form of music that both expressed 
and shaped the culture of black New York City youth in the 1970s. While rap's history appears brief, its relation to the African oral tradition, which provides rap with much of its current social significance, also roots rap in a long-standing history of oral historians, lyrical fetishism, and political advocacy. At the heart of the African oral tradition is the West African idea of Namo. In Malayan, Dagon, cosmology, Namo is the first human, a creation of the supreme deity, Ama, whose creative power lies in the generative property of the spoken word. As a philosophical concept, Namo is the animative ability of words and the delivery of words to act upon objects given life. The significance of Namo in the African oral tradition has given power to rappers and rap music within many African American communities. Rap's common designation as CNN for black people may result from the descendants of rappers from Griots, respected African oral historians and praise singers. Griots were the keepers and purveyors of knowledge, including tribal history, family lineage, and news of births, deaths, and wars. Traveling Griots spread knowledge in an accessible form. The spoken word to members of tribal villages. Similarly, in the United States, many rappers create songs that, through performances and records, spread news of their daily lives, dreams, and discontents outside of their immediate neighborhoods. Rappers are viewed as the voice of poor urban African-American youth whose lives are generally dismissed or misrepresented by the mainstream media. They are the keepers of contemporary African-American working class history and concerns. Additionally, rap's potential for political advocacy stems from the function of its predecessors, African-American rhyming games as forms of resistance to systems of subjugation and slavery. Rhyming games encoded race relations between African-American slaves and their white masters in a way that allowed them to pass the scrutiny of suspicious overseers. Additionally, rhyming games allowed slaves to use their creative intellect to provide inspiration and entertainment. For example, by characterizing the slave as a rabbit and the master as a fox. The Rabbit Tales disguised stories of slaves outwitting their masters and escaping plantations behind the facade of a comical adventure. Hip-hop journalist David D. connects the African oral tradition to modern rap. You see, the slaves were smart and they talked in metaphors. They would be killed if the slave masters heard them speaking in unfamiliar tongues. So they did what modern day rappers do. They flexed their lyrical skills. Rap has developed as a form of resistance to the subjugation of working class African Americans in urban centers. Though it may be seen primarily as a form of entertainment, rap has the powerful potential to address social, economic, and political issues and act as a unifying voice for its audience. Rap shares its roots 
with other forms of traditionally African-American music, such as jazz, blues, and soul. Rap may also be closely linked to reggae music, a genre that also developed from the combination of traditional African drumming and the music of the European ruling class by youth of limited economic means within a system of African economic subjugation. In an ironic circle of influence, Jamaican reggae was played on African-American radio stations in New York in the 1960s. DJs used rhymes to introduce reggae songs. These AM stations could be received in Jamaica, where listeners picked up on the DJ's rhyming styles, extending them over reggae songs to create dub, another forerunner of rap. Cool DJ Herc, before introducing his innovative turntable style, brought his dub style to New York, but it failed to gain popularity. He concentrated on developing his DJing skills which later allowed for the acceptance of emceeing and eventually rap. The development of rap and reggae has been an intertwined path of two different styles, which have grown from and have thrived in similar circumstances. Finally, just as reggae has been under attack for some artists, seeming advocacy of violence to solve social, political, and economic problems. Rap has become the scapegoat of the American musical fabric as it too has faced mass popularity and commercialization. Just as reggae is now under threat of losing its power as an art form and a social voice after being appropriated by those outside of the Rastafarian culture, rap struggles to survive adoption and commodification by those outside of the world of hip hop. In the last decades, hip hop music has followed the path of commercialization that destroyed African American radio stations in the 1970s. Whereas, prior to commercialization, African-American owners, programmers, and DJs had the freedom to use their stations to serve the specific needs of their listeners. New York's working class African-American community, they were able to promote local artists and events and to address news events and social concerns as members of the same community from which they drew their audience. However, as corporations owned by business people outside of the community consolidated power by purchasing local stations, African American AM stations were forced out of the market by more economically powerful stations owned and controlled mainly by members of the white upper class. African American DJs lost their power as the modern day griots of their communities and as the presenters of hip hop music and culture. Similarly, with the discovery of hip hop artists by corporate record labels, Rap music was stolen from its community, repackaged by money-minded business people, looking to create a wider appeal by erasing hip-hop's historic function and sold back to the streets through marketing ploys such as music videos and top 40 charts. By the 1980s, hip-hop had become a business and rap music was a valuable commodity. However, according to journalist Christopher John Farley's, rap's commodification has also 
disenfranchised it as a form of resistance. Corporate America's infatuation with rap has increased as a genre's political content has withered. Ice Cube's early songs attacked white racism. Ice-T sang a song about a cop killer. Public Enemy challenged listeners to fight the power, but many newer acts are focused almost entirely on pathologies within the black community. They rap about shooting other blacks, but almost never about challenging governmental authority or encouraging social activism. Though not new themes, many of the aspects of rap that have been pointed out by politicians as objectionable, violence, misogyny, and homophobia in the lyrics and lifestyles of some rappers may be seen as a function of rap's commodification. While rappers struggle to keep it real, a term which reminds those inside hip hop to be true to their roots, some admit that many rappers do as their record labels wish. Simply, they write lyrics that sell in an audience which has become increasingly ethnically and proven profitable for young African-American male artists that of the pimp, the gangster, and the player, according to African-American musician Michael Franti, in order to be real, we don't all have to be the same. Through the commercialization of today's music, there is a lot of pressure for young black men to conform to very specific roles. The commodification of rap has allowed large paychecks and platinum records to erase the historical social and economic context out of which rap music has emerged from public consciousness. According to David D, the business of music has bastardized rap from its roots as resistance against slavery to its connection to the reggae movement in Jamaica to the appearance of rappers as modern day griots. Rap has traditionally been the music of the subjugated African American working class. While it is important to celebrate hip hop culture today as inclusive of vastly diverse ethnic and economic groups, it is equally important to recognize and preserve the function that rap has served for its original community. In order to understand the themes and forms of rap music, it is important to follow the history of African Americans from their beginnings in West Africa to their enslavement throughout the early history of the United States to their struggles against racial prejudice and segregation after emancipation to the continuing battles against de facto economic. Segregation and reclamation of cultural identity of many African Americans today. If rap music appears to be excessively violent when compared to country western or popular rock, it is because rap stems from a culture that has been seeped in the fight against political, social, and economic oppression. Despite the theatrics sometimes put on for major label albums or MTV videos at the time, for many artists rapping about guns and gang life is a reflection of daily life in racially and economically stratified inner city ghettos and housing projects. Violence in rap is not an effective agent that threatens to harm America's youth. Rather, it is the outcry of an already existing problem from youth whose world views have been shaped by experiencing deep economic inequalities divided largely 
along racial lines. The nihilistic approach to violence and criminal activity for which rap music is often criticized is defended by some artists as the understandable result of disparities that face African American communities from which rap originated and remained rooted. America's most recent census reported that African American youth are the most likely group in the nation to live in poor households and neighborhoods, to be unemployed, to be the victims of homicide or AIDS, or to spend time in prison at some point in their lifetimes. According to Cornel West, a professor of religions and Afro-American studies at Harvard University, it's no accident that one would see various rap songs and various lyrics that revolve around death. Perhaps some of the popularity of the thug life celebrated in the gangster rap subgenre is the opportunity it may provide for economic and social power in neighborhoods where hope has been lost. For many poor inner city youth, the gun which has had a central role in the lyrics of many gangster rappers represents a way to empower oneself and gain respect within continuing cycles of racial and economic prejudice. Additionally, some rappers defend the presence of violence in their lyrics as the manifestation of American history and culture. Journalist Michael Saunders writes, the violence and misogyny and lustful materialism that categorize some rap songs are as deeply American as the hokey music that rappers appropriate. The fact is, this country was in love with outlaws and crime and violence long before hip hop, specifically the African American experience has been shaped by the legacies of slavery, segregation, and economic and political subjugation, and has been marked by institutions and incidents of violence. Rapper Chuck D thinks that much of the violence and nihilism in rap music is the legacy of the hate that minorities have faced in the United States. We African Americans, he says, were a product of what hate produced. We were taught to hate ourselves. So a lot of the conflict is breamed off of ignorance. In order to preserve rap's cultural function and simultaneously to promote artistic and commercial progress, the communities that traditionally been the ones making the music should be the ones that control its production and distribution. Hip hop, including its history, its forms, and its social importance, should be taught in school music curriculum alongside classical music, folk music, and jazz. The inclusion of rap in music education programs may also allow students and teachers to have an open discourse on related issues, such as the relationship between rap music and gangs, the presence of violence, misogyny, and homophobia in some rap songs, and the debate over musical rating and adversary systems. Additionally, rap could be integrated into English and language arts curriculum as a form of both poetry and drama. Allowing students to write and perform their own rap encourages them to think critically, to practice writing in the narrative form, to increase vocabulary, and to develop an understanding of rhyme and rhythm. In order to understand hip hop, 
it is necessary to look at it as the product of a set of historical, political, and economic circumstances, and to study the role it has served as a voice for those subjugated by systematic, political, and economic oppression. With that being said, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. My name is Gary Harrison. And remember, stay humble and stay hungry. And I'll catch you on the next one.